<laughs> Hello, everybody. Hello. <laughs> so presumably you're experiencing this from what seems like is a point of view staring at a screen, right? I don't even mean it in the sense of you looking at your phone, you're looking at your computer. I mean that in the sense of you looking at your own consciousness, right? It kind of feels like you're some kind of center of awareness in the middle of your head. And it's looking at a screen in front of it, right? That's how experience is presented. You know, it's as if that is happening. Of course, you know, there's a lot of arguments against the whole notion of the Cartesian theater and that there's ways of resuscitating it <laughs> in a way. I would say that Lehar's, you know, cartoon epistemology, um, you know, all the visualizations where he makes, where we are kind of in a diorama-like shape that with projective tricks, it makes you feel like you can see, you know, points at infinity, but actually they're just right there in front of you. We are all <laughs> little bubble worlds. Yeah, that kind of revives, you know, still mends the idea that in some sense, really, there is a point of view <laughs> from which you're staring at a screen of consciousness. More so, you know, if you go deep into, you know, meditation, the path of meditation and so on, there are stages that essentially feel like what Frank Yang would describe as the screen of God, where you're kind of like the eternal witness, just looking at <laughs> a kind of, you know, transpersonal sort of like screen, you know, Bardo place where you see kind of the eternal play of form or something like that. Well, yes, but then there are much deeper states, you know, like really deep ego death or very deep in meditation or in some of the formless jhanas. And of course, you know, the absolute, <laughs> all those extreme states. Oh, and 5-MeO DMT. Well, yes, where the screen of consciousness fades away. But it's not just like, you know, it's kind of like fading in front of you and becoming transparent or something like that. No, no, no. There's something so much deeper, so much deeper that can happen, which is that the whole projective nature of experience breaks down and is revealed to be just a very, very specific, special corner case of the actual, you know, range of possible layouts for experience. And here is the thing. It is not that, you know, there's a pre-existing space-time which functions as kind of like a pixel, you know, a pixel screen with voxels for experience. I, I would claim that that already narrowed down enormously, you know, what kind of presentation for consciousness there might be. I would say instead, let's break down this idea that there is a pre-existing screen and instead think about how the experience of a screen could arise out of non-screen elements, <laughs> as it were. Well, you know, let's uh, think step by step. So essentially, we have to reason about points of view, at least in conventional everyday reality you get the feeling that reality is experienced from points of view, right? Specific points of view um, from which you can, you know, uh, look at a system and then gather information about it. Well, here's the thing. <laughs> In physics, <laughs> um, points cannot actually gather information. Why? Because there's such a thing as a diffraction limit. Actually, you can't have an infinitesimal point to function as kind of like the pinpoint for your camera because light actually behaves like waves. And so it doesn't actually go through that pinch point, that pinhole without losing information. It actually bounces off of it and, you know, you get diffraction, you get a lot of loss of information. Um, more so, you know, it's not like the information is usually expressed in the whole itself. It's actually expressed on a screen. But then you have the problem of who is looking at the screen, 
right? Like you have a bootstrapping problem. You know, you're trying to explain the experience of a screen by appealing to a screen, but then you have to think about what is the point of view that is looking at that screen as well. <laughs> and then what are the boundaries around that screen? How can there be objective, you know, frame invariant boundaries around that screen if the screen is, for the most part, a conventional entity, you know, <laughs> made of, you know, clo clothing or something like that, a fabric, a particular fabric. So instead, I would say that, you know, whatever actually is partitioning your experience, making it different than every other experience, has to be an objective and frame invariant boundary. Again, you know, at QRI, our most, you know, promising hypothesis here is topological boundaries. But then the question arises, which is, how is it possible that you have a screen-like experience within the inside of a topological boundary? Is it like, I don't know, like, you know, Plato's, Plato's cave? Are you looking at, you know, the walls of, <laughs> of the to topological pocket or something like that? Actually, I think there's something extremely strange and trippy here going on that once you grasp, a lot of things start to make sense, especially the more extreme screen-less type of experiences. And that is that there is a amazing, you know, extremely deep equivalence between field behavior and the superposition of every possible path at once. You know, this is like the difference between the, you know, Schrodinger equation formulation of quantum mechanics, where essentially in permutation space, you know, the particles are essentially their state is evolving according to the Schrodinger equation. And in that sense, you can think of it as like a smooth field. Alternatively, you also have the formulation where is it the Feynman, you know, path integral formulation, where essentially you have every possible path simultaneously happening and all of them essentially in a state of superposition and essentially yeah then you add up all the amplitudes and you know okay then you have the Born rule where the probability of observing a particle is proportional to the square of the added up amplitude <laughs> once you add up all the possible paths well you know from that point of view then you can think of what is going on inside a topological pocket that is trapping, let's say, a bunch of electrons as either, you know, it's kind of like a field in the pocket, or you can think of it as a superposition of all of the possible paths and interference patterns, all the ways in which, you know, an electron can bounce off of itself within that pocket, you know? So if you think about it from that perspective, then all of a sudden... <laughs> you arrive at the very strange perspective that maybe there is such a thing as an outer shape for your consciousness and an inner shape for your consciousness. The outer shape would perhaps be what the actual shape of the field looks like, what the boundaries are that separated from the you know universal field around it. The inner shape would be what does it feel like to be that pocket? which would be equivalent to what it feels like to be every possible path within it in a state of superposition. So I would actually reason from here, you know, that the screen of consciousness only arises when it looks like there is a screen from every possible path within the pocket, which actually, actually means that the pocket is very, very particularly shaped. You know, it's not an arbitrary pocket. If you choose instead, you know, something that has the outer shape of something like an electron orbital, you know, a very natural kind of <laughs> topological pocket in physics, well, I think that actually corresponds with things such as like mystical experiences. Because an electron orbital is extremely symmetric. I mean, there's some that are, you know, continuously symmetric, let's say like a sphere-shaped electron orbital. So within it, you know... Um, for every particular point of view within that pocket, there is a huge number of other points of view that are exactly the same. And so whenever you have, you know, a, an outer shape such that <laughs> there are many points within, you know, the pocket that look the same, 
then, you know, the inner shape of that experience will be one where that point of view, which is repeated all over, will be one that has a lot of weight. Essentially, that one doesn't cancel itself out because there's a lot of it. <laughs> and so whenever you have, you know, kind of like a very powerful symmetry, meaning that there's a lot of dots that look the same, or if you use it as the point of view to look the same, then that will be a very representative component of the experience. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, actually, when you're experiencing extremely highly symmetrical states of consciousness, the dimensionality of experience is, it kind of collapses. It actually vanishes in, in, in many ways because every point looks the same within that pocket. And I think these explains, yeah, things such as like 5-MeO DMT. Why do you disappear, right? Why, why does like space and time disappear when you become so smooth? You know, your field becomes so smooth. And I think that is because the dots within that field cannot distinguish themselves anymore. <laughs> They're all the same point of view. And yeah, I mean, the last thing I will say about these, there's a lot more I could say, but for the time being is that well, if this is the case, then actually, you know, pay attention to the subjective quality of having a screen of consciousness, as it were, and notice that whenever there's something really compelling that is happening in a subset of your experience, let's say like a very intricate motion in one of your hands, notice how if you get absorbed by it, if you really kind of like accurately pay attention to it and kind of identify with it, it recenters your experience, right? If you're doing something really intricate with your hand, it actually feels in some sense like you are there. Not necessarily you know, that your body is positioned to it, you know, relative to it. It's more like that the waves of attention emerge out of that place where you're paying a lot of attention. So in that sense, actually, I would say you're, you're recentering the screen. It's just that most of the time, you know, most of the waves of attention are essentially being um, their ori origin point is approximately that of our conventional sense of self. <laughs> but change the sense of self, the screen goes away, very crazy, you know, collapsation of dimensions happen. And I think that only makes sense, you know, from the theoretical angle I proposed, which was that you need to <laughs> simultaneously add every possible point of view within the pocket, and that will get you there. All right, <laughs> infinite please. Thank you so much.